All right, good morning. We are glad to be here and glad that you are here with us at Coastal Baptist Church this morning. For all of you that are here in person with you, it's great to see everyone out together this morning. For those of you that are watching uh, live there via Facebook or YouTube or whatever platform you're using to uh, watch there, we are thankful that you are here with us as well. And for those of you that would watch this later on, we are thankful that you are here and uh, able to participate in our service here together with us. We're in John chapter number 4. Uh, this morning, although that we could uh, carry this on and carry this kind of series within the series right now uh, on about worship. We've been looking for the last couple of weeks, although we could carry it on and continue to talk more about worship and what it is and how it applies to our lives and what we can do as far as worship goes. This morning, we're going to go ahead and kind of bring to an end uh, this mini series of, of worship that we've looked at for the last Three weeks, And so over the last couple of weeks, if you've not been here with us or uh, if perhaps you haven't had an opportunity to watch online, uh, just to go through and kind of give you a, 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 a quick reminder of what we've looked at so far, we've been looking at John chapter 4 in this conversation that the woman at the well had with the Lord Jesus Christ. And he says to her there, uh, she brings up the question of, of worship and begins to talk about and has this conversation about worship. And, and let's go ahead and go to the scriptures there and, and read what she says. And in John chapter number 4, in verse number 20, uh, she says to Jesus, Our fathers worshipped in this mountain, and ye say that in Jerusalem is the place where men ought to worship. And then Jesus says to her in verse 21, Woman, believe me, the hour cometh, when ye shall neither in this mountain nor yet at Jerusalem worship the Father. Ye worship, ye know not what. We know what we worship for salvations of the Jews. But the hour cometh and now is when the true worshipers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth, for the Father seeketh such to worship Him. God is a spirit, and they that worship Him must worship Him in spirit and in truth. Uh, we went and we started by talking about what worship is. And if you go throughout the Word of God almost 200 times uh, that the word worship or some form of it is used in our Bible uh, today, we look at that. And the word worship itself literally means both in the Old Testament and in the New Testament, uh, the, the word that is used literally means to, to fall down before, uh, to, to lie on the ground, to bow the knee, to kneel down. Uh, to uh, to uh, in every in every way to lower oneself, and so we see that uh, throughout the Word of God, and and we see that as people came into the presence of the Lord, that this is what happened from the Old Testament to the New Testament, and so that we just define worship as uh, a, an outward reaction. Uh, uh, or, or an outward response to an inward recognition of who God is. And, and, and so literally worship has the idea all throughout the Bible of bowing down on one's knee, of lowering oneself, of, of humbly bowing before. And so we saw that uh, uh, as far as what worship is. And then last week we talked about some misconceptions of worship. Uh, there are a lot of people in the world in which we live today who would say the word worship and they would automatically associate that with music or they would automatically associate that with a church service. And we talked about some misconceptions, three in particular, out of this passage of John chapter 4 last week. We talked about how uh, a lot of people think that, well, worship is only done at church. And Jesus said, that's not the case. Worship isn't going to be done in this mountain. It's not going to be done at Jerusalem. Why? Because worship is done in the presence of God Almighty. And you and I have God Almighty with us wherever we go because we have the Holy Spirit of God with us and we can worship wherever we are. And then we talk about how worship is not just about religious preferences. It's not just about, well, I feel like this is worship, so I can do this. The woman there, at uh, the woman of Samaria, her Samaritan religion, she was, had been married five times. She was living in adultery, but she thought, well, my worship is okay. This worship is fine. And we see how people all over the world do what they call worship and think that they're okay before God when truly uh, they are not, according to God's word, they are not true worshipers according to the Word of God because the Bible tells us that those that would be true worshipers must worship Him in spirit and 
in truth. And so we spoke and we talked about how the third misconception is often that people, they, they equate worship with an emotional response, most often in a church service to music or to something of that nature, an emotional response to some perceived truth. In other words, I felt something and it felt good and I feel good and I was at church, so therefore it must have been good. I, I must have worshiped. This must be what worship is. And oftentimes, uh, worship is based on emotions, and we talked about how that is another misconception. But this morning, we're going to look at things that are associated with worship. A lot of times, we take things that are associated with worship, and uh, we call those things worship themselves. But this morning, we're going to take a look throughout the Word of God. So I want you to get your Bibles ready and be ready to flip and turn. We're going to be looking at the Old Testament. We're going to be looking at the New Testament. We're going to go throughout the Word of God, and we're going to look at different attitudes and approaches and actions that all have to do and are associated with worship. If I were to begin to give you a list, I'm going to give it here in just a moment. I want you to think about this, all right? So if you're, if you're falling asleep this morning, wake up real quick. All right, I want you to think for a moment. I want you to, uh, as I give these to you, I don't think this will be very hard, all right? But just to illustrate what we're talking about today and to go through, I want you to have an understanding as we get ready to jump in. All right, here we go. I'm going to give you a list of words, and you listen. All right, here we go. What comes to mind when I give you these? Prizes. You don't have to shout it out loud unless you get really excited, okay? And then, and then you can, all right? Prizes, funnel cake, cotton candy, Ferris wheel, Krispy Kreme cheeseburger. How many of you have ever had one of those before? Nope, nobody in here. I was at a, what do all those words remind us of and that we think about? We think about a fair, a carnival. We think about a, a thing that travels around. Now, let me ask you, if I were to hand you a funnel cake, would you take that funnel cake and would you go, oh, a fair? Well, no. Nobody take, if, 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 if I were to meet you at the door back there this morning and I were to say, congratulations, you're number 72. You get a prize. Would you take that and would you go, oh, look, it's a fair? Well, no, you wouldn't do that. If, if I were to, and I know some of you are thinking, Krispy Kreme cheeseburger, you still can't get past that, I know right now, but I was at I was a fair in the Louisville uh, Fair, the Kentucky State Fair there in Louisville, and there was actually a vendor there, and they were selling, and they sold Krispy Kreme cheeseburgers, and if it's as good as what you think it is, or if it's as bad as what you think it is, um, you might be right, depending on your view of that, but uh, uh, Krispy Kreme cheeseburger, but I wouldn't hand you this morning, or 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 if we were to uh, come in here and I sold you a little figurine and had you a little figurine, I say sell you, if I gave you a little figurine of a Ferris wheel, you probably wouldn't take that and you go, oh, this is a fair. No, you would call it by its name. But all of those things are associated with a fair. None of them in and of themselves is the fair. None of them uh, are what you would look at and say, oh, this is a fair. Oh, this is a carnival. But yet, in a very real sense, all of those things are certainly very closely associated with the fair, and they are things that take place at a fair or at a carnival. Much the same way, as we look at some of the, the uh, things that we're going to be talking about this morning and looking at, we're going to see none of these in and of themselves is worship. We've already talked about what worship is. We've already talked about what worship is not. But I do want us to see all of the things that are associated with worship and how God brings this all together in His Word. Let's go to the Lord in prayer right now, and then we're going to jump right into the message this morning. Father, I pray that you would bless the time together this morning in your Word. I pray that you would use this message. I pray that you would use it in each and every heart, that we might see the things that are associated in the Word of God with worship. And I pray that you would help these things to... Uh, be in our lives and to be a part of our lives. And Father, I, I truly pray that as a church and as individuals, Lord, that we would worship You and that we would have hearts that are full of worship as we leave this morning. And it's in Jesus' name we do pray. Amen. I want you to go with me and look, first of all, together uh, at the attitude towards worship. Psalm chapter 95 
Psalm chapter 95, I believe this is a, a great verse to, to look at. We could literally go through almost uh, every time that worship is mentioned or many times uh, that worship is mentioned. And we spoke a couple of weeks ago about worship and, and what worship literally is. Now the Bible again and again refers to us falling down and, and bowing down. And in Psalm 95 and verse number 6, we see here that the Bible says, O come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord, our Maker. The first thing I want you to see as far as it goes with an attitude towards worship is an attitude of humility. An attitude of humility. All throughout the Word of God, when the Bible speaks about worship, we see men, we see women coming and, and, and bowing down and falling down before the Lord with a heart full of humility that is shown in the way that they respond to the Lord. A heart of humility. In Psalm 132 and verse 7, the Bible says, We will go into His tabernacles. We will worship at His footstool. You must come, when you come to the Lord, you must come not walking with a pride and an arrogancy. Uh, we must in humility come before the Lord. And although humility in and of itself is not worship, I do not believe that you can have worship without humility. Uh, you cannot come proudly to worship before the Lord. Andrew Murray said, The humble man has learned the secret of abiding gladness. The weaker he feels, the lower he sinks, and the greater his humiliations appear, the more power and the presence of Christ are his portion. God's word says it this way in James chapter 4 and verse number 6, but he giveth more grace. Wherefore he saith, God resisteth the proud, but giveth grace unto the humble. You see, pride is the exact opposite of everything worship is meant to be. Uh, worship is meant to be coming before the Lord, lifting Him up and lowering ourselves, understanding that I am nothing and that He is everything, understanding that He is God Almighty and I am just nothing in my flesh in and of me. I am nothing. And that is what I do when I bow down. I bow down as, as, as before a superior and, as, and before someone who is greater and someone who is of authority. And in my understanding of, of who God is is what brings me into worship and an understanding of who I am brings me to that point of worship. And there must be an attitude of humility. Could you imagine if someone were to, if we were to think about the whole coming before a king or coming before someone uh, and coming before them uh, in a prideful and an arrogant way? Can you imagine someone coming in the presence of, of someone of great authority and them coming up and saying, uh, you know, well, I'm obviously better than you are, and I'm obviously, I mean, I don't need you, but I, I will acknowledge that you are the king. No, that's, that's not the way to do it. Uh, the pride is not something that we can bring before the Lord in, in, in any sort of way that, that would be involved with worship. Pride is the exact opposite of what worship is meant to be. You know, oftentimes in our life, if we're not careful, we can let pride creep in. Oftentimes in our life, if we're not careful, we can allow pride to creep into an area of our life where we begin to think of ourselves more highly than we ought to think. You know why in the book of Romans and, and Romans chapter number 12, and I believe it's verse number 3 there or verse number 5, somewhere in that area that talks about how uh, we, that men ought not to think of themselves more highly than we ought to think because men tend to think of themselves more highly than they ought to think. That's why the Word of God is there. You know why the Bible talks against pride so much? Because it's something that so easily comes into our lives. It's something that so easily can be behind everything that we do and, and who we tend to be and who we are. If we're not careful and we don't live a life of humility and we don't draw ourselves closer to Christ and if we don't humble ourselves before God, we can become very prideful and very arrogant in what we do, thinking that we are right, thinking that I am the, it's my opinion that matters, I am the only one that matters. And, and, and a lot of people would wouldn't say that with their mouths, but they would live that with their lives. So we must be careful of this ugly, wretched thing called pride. The Bible says God hates pride. He hates a proud look. 
The Bible talks about how only by pride cometh contention. And, and the Bible talks about how a haughty man and someone with a haughty spirit, that, that that is the person that's going to fall. That's going to be the person that comes to a crash in their life. So we must have an attitude of humility as we come before the Lord and as we come to worship. Notice not only an attitude of humility, but as we go through God's Word, we see again and again this thought of humility, but then we see this thought of an attitude of fear. An attitude of fear. In Psalm chapter 5, in verse number 7, Psalm chapter 5, in verse number 7, the Bible says this, But as for me, I will come into thy house in the multitude of thy mercy, and in thy fear will I worship toward thy holy temple. As for me, I will come into thy house in the multitude of thy mercy, and in thy fear will I worship toward thy holy temple. In the book of Revelation, chapter number 14 and verse 7, the Bible says, saying with a loud voice, an angel there says with a loud voice, Fear God and give glory to Him, for the hour of His judgment is come, and worship Him that made heaven and earth and the sea and the fountains of water. You say, what does that mean to have an attitude of fear? Does it mean that I'm cowering down in a corner somewhere, afraid to come out, afraid of, of, of everything and fearful? Not in the sense of walking around afraid all the time. The Bible says that God's not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. But here when the Bible talks about fearing God, it does speak of a reverential fear and a reverential awe of who God is. It does mean that I understand that, yes, God is a God of love, and yes, God is a God of mercy, but God is also a God who is a holy God. He's also a God who is uh, a jealous God. That we, we looked at that last week. He's also a God who, who demands that we live a right life. You know, one of the things I'm afraid that we've lost today and we've lost in the generation, uh, my generation somewhat, but definitely the generation that's coming up behind me, and I think you see this all the time, we've lost this idea of an attitude of fear in anything that we do. Amen. Just turn on your TV. Look at those that are out in the streets that will disrespect an authority figure like a police officer. Police officer says, <laughs> I was speaking with... I was speaking with, um, I believe Brother Don and I were talking last week, and we were talking about there was a day that when someone that was an authority figure said something to you, you stopped and you listened and you'd obey, whether you liked it or not. All right? Now, I'm not, I'm not here this morning advocating for us following after authority figures who are telling us to do wrong or anything of that nature. All right? So understand that for those of you here. For those of you who are watching online, I'm not advocating that you, all, you have to do something if someone tells you it, and it's sin and it's wrong that you're to do it. I'm not advocating for that whatsoever. I'm simply trying to state this morning, we have lost a sense of respect and a sense of fear in our nation, and I'm afraid in our Christianity in our lives as well. Amen. We talk about living our lives for the Lord and living our lives before the Lord, and uh, yet we have no fear of living in wrong and living in sin and doing something that's opposing contrary to the Word of God. Certainly when we come before the Lord, when we come to worship, the Bible speaks of this attitude of fear that we are to have, this reverence for who God is. Listen, if someone were to come in this morning, and, and before I go any farther, just let me say, I'm not equating the office of the president to that of God this morning by any means whatsoever, all right? But understand, if the president of the United States came in and walked through the back door this morning, I dare say that we would have an attitude of reverence and a respect for the office and for the person who was holding that office when they came in the back door this morning. You would probably stand. You would probably want to, uh, I don't know if you want to shake the president's hand or not, but that's between you and the president and the Lord right now. But uh, I don't know where you would be and what your feelings would be and what you would do, but certainly the office demands respect. Many of you in the military right now, and many of you have been in the military, you understand the military. military if there is an officer and you are under the rank of that officer, there is a respect that is, that is given 
to that rank. There's a respect that is given to the person that is holding that rank. There is a fear, if I may, that is given to them. Certainly when we come into the presence of God to worship Him, the Bible says there is to be a fear of God. There is to be a reverence and a respect. Listen, I'm here to tell you this morning, God is not the man upstairs, all right? He's he's not some curse word that's just to be thrown around out there. He's not just another name. He is God Almighty. He is the Lord of all creation. And as such, we are to fear Him. And we are to worship in fear, the Bible says. There's to be an attitude of fear when we come before the Lord. I don't want you to think this morning that as believers, if you're watching there, I don't want you to think this morning that we live our lives going, oh, we serve some big bully God. No, we don't serve a big bully God. We serve a God who is merciful. We serve a God who is long-suffering. We serve a God who is holy and just. And we serve a God who is greater than any other. And He deserves our respect and our fear. And so we see an attitude of fear. We see an attitude of humility. We see this attitude of fear. But then there ought to be an attitude of praise. When we come before the Lord, the Bible says, and I'm going to read some verses here to you in Psalm 138 and verse number 2. The Bible says, I will worship toward thy holy temple and praise thy name for thy loving kindness and for thy truth. 2 Chronicles chapter number 7 and verse number 3, the Bible says, when, And when all the children of Israel saw how the fire came down and the glory of the Lord came upon the house, they bowed themselves with their faces to the ground upon the pavement and worshipped and praised the Lord, saying, For He is good, for His mercy endureth forever. Could I ask you this morning, when is the last time that you worshipped the Lord? And you just praise God for who He is and for what He has done. When was the last time that you came into God's presence and and you bowed down and and, and your heart full and and the spirit that we talked about last week, how how the Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit of God that lived within you, that as you saw uh, who God was, as you see who God is in your life and you see His greatness and you see His might and His power and, and, and you want to give Him the glory, that your spirit, that you bow down in your spirit before Him and perhaps even physically you, you bow down on the ground and you worship the Lord, and you just praised Him and gave Him and came with an attitude of praise and an attitude of God is good. In both these verses that I read, uh, the Bible says that they, that, that, that they praise the Lord because of His loving kindness, because of His truth, because of His goodness, because His mercy endure forever. Do you know all the things that we could praise God for if we were to go around this morning? Worship certainly is something that we are to come before the Lord with an attitude of praise. And, and, and when we worship, there ought to be times of when we're worshiping the Lord that praise would just come off of our lips. It's hard to look and to sit and and to come before the Lord in His presence. It's hard to think about who He is and not give Him praise for what He has done. If I were to sit here and I were to ask you this morning, what's something God's done in your life today? If I were to work my way back and I were to say, what's something God's done in your life this last week? What's God, what did God do this last month? What has God done this last year? What's He done in the last 10 years of your life? What has God done in the... Certainly as we look back over our lives and we see who God is and we see what He has done, their praise should just easily flow out of our mouths. In Psalm 146, in verses 1 and 2, the psalmist writes, Praise ye the Lord. Praise the Lord, O my soul. While I live, will I praise the Lord. I will sing praises unto my God while I have any being. Praise ought to be something that comes so natural to the believer that it should not be something that when it is time for us to praise Him or give Him thanks, that we go, well, um, uh, uh, well, um, yeah, well what, uh, uh, um, let me see there. If I said... Could you just give God praise for something? It shouldn't be hard. It shouldn't be difficult. And certainly when we come before His presence and we're worshiping Him, acknowledging who He is, praise is just something that comes naturally as we think about who God is and what He has done. We see this attitude 
that we come before the Lord. And these things that are associated with, with worship as I have an attitude of, of humility and an attitude of fear and an attitude of, of praise. None of these things in and of themselves are worship, but they are certainly things in God's Word that we see associated with worship and an attitude that I should have as I come before the Lord. But then I want you to see, second of all, not only this attitude towards worship, but then the approach towards worship, the approach to worship. All throughout the Bible, we see the word holy used. Over 600 times the word holy is used. A hundred of those times, a little bit more than a hundred of those times, it's used referring to the Holy Ghost or to the Holy Spirit. So more than 500 times, though, the Bible speaks of the word holy whether it's defining God as being as, as, the, as the angels would cry, holy, 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 or whether it's talking about a holy life and a holy manner in which we are to live, or if it's talking about the holy things of the temple or whatever it may be, over 500 times in the Word of God, we see the word holy used. And certainly when we approach and when we come to God, we know and we recognize that He is a holy God. Psalm 99 and verse number 5 says, Exalt ye the Lord our God and worship at His footstool, for He is holy. We worship because He is holy. That's one of the reasons. But what I want you to see here in this approach to holiness has more to do with you and with me, not so much of God's holiness, although that definitely plays a part. But what I want you to see is in these verses, there's a phrase that's used. And I want you to listen and catch. I'm going to read three verses to you here. And I want you to hear the phrase that's used again in each one of these verses. First Chronicles 16 and verse number 29. The Bible says, Give unto the Lord the glory due unto His name. Bring an offering and come before Him. Worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. Psalm 29, 2 says, Give unto the Lord the glory due unto His name. Worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. Psalm 96, 9 says, Oh, worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. Fear before Him all the earth. The word beauty that's used there in those three verses, it's only used, I believe, four or five times there in the Old Testament. And it's, it has this idea of adornment, of putting on. And so if we were to look at that in that phrase, and as the Bible says, worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness, what is he saying? He's saying there that we are to worship the Lord as we put on, as we adorn holiness. It has the idea of you and I putting on the holiness, you and I coming before the Lord and, and having this approach of a right approach of being holy and of being right with the Lord as we come to worship Him. Have you ever had your child have something happen, perhaps for those of you that are parents or for those of you uh, that grandparents even, have you ever had your child do something that they disobey you or that something has happened and maybe, maybe you said something, maybe they said something, but something's not quite right there between you and your child, and you can tell. You're not sure what it is. You're not sure if it's something that they've done, or maybe it was something that you said that, uh, you know, but you could tell that something was wrong because they didn't quite want to uh, come around, or they didn't quite want to have that normal relationship that they normally have. You could just tell that there's something wrong there. Or, or maybe it would be that way. You can just tell some with a relationship with someone else. You can tell when something's not quite right. It could be a friend. It could be a spouse. But you can tell something's not quite right. Usually you fix that problem and then everything is fine. You fix the problem and then everything is okay. Here in the Word of God, as we look at that phrase uh, multiple times used throughout the Word of God, specifically talking about when we come to worship Him, it has the idea of us coming before the Lord and putting on holiness and, and, and coming in a right way and in a right manner. You see, it's, we cannot live a life full of sin and not have things right with the Lord and then still say, oh, but yeah, I worship Him. Oh, I worship God all the time. 
You can't live a life full of sin and do whatever you want to and, and, and have uh, all of this wrong in your life that you know is contrary to God and then be able to say, oh yeah, I'm fine with God. I worship Him all the time. See, at the end, at the end of the day, worship, I've said this several times, worship is not about us. Worship is about God. And worship is something that the Bible says that the Father seeks and He desires to have our worship. But we cannot worship Him as we should and worship Him as we ought if we are not living the holy life that He intended for us to live. In 1 Peter chapter 1, in verses 15 and 16, the Bible says, But as He which hath called you is holy, so be ye holy in all manner of conversation, because it is written, Be ye holy, for I am holy. Romans 12, 1, Brother Larry just pre uh, preached and taught on this in the Sunday school hour uh, last week, but uh, Romans 12, 1, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice. And then what's the very next word that he says? Holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. You and I ought to live holy lives. You and I ought to live a life that uh, is not a life that looks like the world and acts like the world and talks like the world and lives like the world. No, we are to live lives that are holy before the Lord. But I'm afraid in the day and age in which we live, just as the world moves farther and farther away from God, so I'm afraid that believers follow after and, and do the same things oftentimes. We, 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 and I say we, and I don't mean we in particular here at this church, but churches all across the world today uh, preach and teach, uh, you know, that, that you can be just like you are and God accepts you just as you are and it, it doesn't matter what you live like and it doesn't matter. Choose your lifestyle and, and, and choose your uh, identity and choose whatever you want. God will accept you and God loves you just like you are. Well, I'm here to tell you that God does love you. The Bible says that God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. But God does not accept sin. God does not look at someone's life and say, oh, you know what? You go ahead and you sin all you want to and do whatever you want to and live whatever you want to. And even if it's contrary to the Word of God, you just go ahead and do what you like. And then I'll still accept your worship and everything will still be fine and we'll be good. That's, I'm here to tell you it's not the way that it works. God demands holiness in His Word. He's called us. The book of Titus tells us that, he's, that He called us and that, and that He purchased us and, uh, to make us a peculiar people and that, and that He uh, chose us to, to purify His people. And I, I'm messing that verse all up there, but uh, let me see. if I, Titus 2.14 says, He gave Himself for us that He might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto Himself a peculiar people. Uh, he, he has called us to be a pure person before Him. He saved us so that we could be saved and molded and, and made into the image of His Son. Uh, the Bible says that He desires for us to live a pure and a clean and a holy life. And as we come to worship Him, there's a right approach in which to do it, and it's the approach of, of holiness and coming before Him. You say, well, how do you get there? Well, I, I think a point, a way in which we see that uh, is in Nehemiah chapter number 9, verse, verses one through, th 1 through 3 there. The Bible tells us that this approach to holiness, that there is confession as well in this approach to worship, that there is confession. In Nehemiah chapter 9, verses 1 through 3, as we read here, this is one of the places in the Word of God that talks about confessing and worship. In other words, getting things right before we come to worship the Lord. Nehemiah chapter 9, the Bible says, Now in the twenty and fourth day of this month, the children of Israel were assembled with fasting and with sackcloth and earth upon them. And the seed of Israel separated themselves from all strangers and stood and confessed their sins and the iniquities of their fathers. And they stood up in their place and read in the book of the law of the Lord their God one fourth part of the day and another fourth part they confessed and worshiped the Lord their God. They got into the Word of God. They saw their sin. When they saw their sin, they did what? They confessed their sin. They got it right. By the way, it took them a fourth part of the day, the Bible says. It took them a few hours that they got out and that they are confessing their sin. 
For a few hours, they were in the Word of God. For a few hours, they were confessing their sin. And then the Bible says, and then they worshiped the Lord their God. See, we must be right before the Lord. We can't live a life however we want to and whatever we desire to do and live a life full of sin and then say, oh, I've come to worship the Lord. I'm ready to worship the Lord. Well, not if you're living in unconfessed sin. Not if you're living a life apart from the Lord Jesus Christ. We must be holy and must come with that approach of holiness and of confessing our sin before the Lord in order to worship in the way in which the Lord desired for us to. Now, let's look at Last of all, actions in worship. Actions in worship. We see the right attitude and, and the right approaches as we come for the Lord with an attitude of humility, an attitude of fear, an attitude of praise. As we come with this approach uh, of, of, of a holy life and a life that has confessed the sin and, and is ready and prepared to worship the Lord as He deserves, now we see some actions in worship. These are some of the areas in which Sometimes we would confuse this with worship itself. Let's go through these very quickly. First of all, uh, we see actions in giving. I want you to see Deuteronomy chapter 26 and verse number 10. The Bible says, And now behold, I have brought the first fruits of the land which thou, O Lord, hast given me, and thou shalt set it before the Lord thy God and worship before the Lord thy God. What are they doing? They're bringing the first fruits of the land. They're bringing the first of their crops. They're bringing the first of everything that God has blessed them with. And they're giving it to the Lord and they're bringing it as a gift and they are worshiping the Lord as they do that. Give you a New Testament example. In Matthew chapter 2 and verse number 11, the wise men come and the Bible says, when they were coming to the house, they saw the young child with Mary his mother and fell down and worshiped him. And when they had opened their treasures... They presented unto him gifts, gold and frankincense and myrrh. You say, what, is, what are the actions in worship or what are some of the actions that can be involved in worship? First of all, we see here giving, giving. See, giving to the Lord is something that can be involved in and associated with our worship. When our hearts and our spirit within us understand who God is, and when the spirit within us uh, recognizes God Almighty in our life and understands who He is and understands what He has done and understands all that He is to us and all that He's blessed us with and all that He's given us, and when that is clear in our hearts and we bow before the Lord and we worship a part of that and a part of having a desire to, uh, should be a desire to give back to the Lord and to give to the Lord. You say, oh no, here we go. You're going to start talking about giving and start preaching about, no, 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 listen to me. Giving starts with your heart, not your wallet. Giving starts with your heart, not your wallet. You see, when we have the right relationship with the Lord and when we have the right recognition of who He is and our spirit understands within us, understands who God Almighty is, and we come to worship Him, we, we should want to give back to Him. Not just pull out our wallet and say, all right, fine, I'll give to the Lord. No, no, no. We should want to give our lives back to Him. We should want to give ourselves back to Him. That's what Romans 12 is talking about, giving ourselves as a living sacrifice. Now, does God's Word preach on giving and talk about giving and talk about that? Absolutely, sure it does. That's all a part of, first, our hearts being given back and our lives being given back. And if God has your heart, He'll have your wallet. If God has your heart, He'll have your pocketbook. If God has your heart, He'll have all that. God doesn't ask to, uh, anyone to give financially begrudgingly. He talks about being a cheerful giver. And if God has our heart and He already has all of us, it's all His anyway. We understand that. We're just stewards of it. And so certainly the Lord talks about giving. And certainly He talks about those things. But we're talking about here uh, an attitude and, and an action that's involved as we worship the Lord. As our spirit understands who He is and we bow before Him, we say, Lord, we, we acknowledge who You are. And along the way here, part of that we are in turn then, uh, there's something within us that says, I want to give back for all that God has done. I want to give. It might be your life. It might be financially. It might be in, 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 in other ways. But giving back to the Lord. We see this giving. Then we see, we see praying as well. 
in Matthew chapter 8 and Matthew 19 and Matthew uh, chapter uh, or Matthew 8 and Matthew 9 and then Matthew 15, we see three different instances of people coming to the Lord. One, a leper that came to the, to the Lord and the Bible says that he worshiped the Lord and then he prays to the Lord and says, Lord, if thou will, thou canst make me clean. And, and there's this prayer and this conversation that goes on with the Lord. In Matthew 9, the Bible says that there was someone who came, that there was a ruler that came and worshiped the Lord. And then he prays and says, he says, my daughter is, is dead, is, is, uh, but, but if you come and lay your hand upon her, I know that she'll live. In Matthew chapter 15, the Bible says that she came and worshiped him saying, Lord, help me. Here is the, a lady who was coming before the Lord and looking for help. But all of these instances are instances where uh, we see people coming and bowing down and worshiping the Lord Jesus Christ, but then uh, praying and having this conversation, asking, Lord, will you, will, you, will you work in my life? Will you work in my child's life? Will you work in another way? When we come and when we uh, worship before the Lord and we acknowledge who He is, and we understand that He's God Almighty. We understand that He's the great physician. We understand that there's nothing that He can't do. It, worship lends itself to us spending time in conversation and in prayer with the Lord. And so certainly prayer is one of the actions of worship. And then we see probably the number one thing that is misrepresented as being worship, and that would be singing. Singing in and of itself is not worship, but it's certainly something that is associated with worship in the Word of God. In Psalm 66 and verse number 4, the Bible says, All the earth shall worship thee and shall sing unto thee. They shall sing to thy name, Selah. In 2 Chronicles chapter 29 and verses 27 through 30, the Bible says, And Hezekiah commanded to offer the burnt offering upon the altar. And when the burnt offering began, the song of the Lord began also with the trumpets and with the instruments ordained by David, king of Israel. And all the congregation worshipped, and the singers sang, and the trumpeters sounded, and all this continued until the burnt offering was finished. And when they had made an end of offering, the king and all that were present with him bowed themselves and worshipped. Moreover, Hezekiah the king and the princes commanded the Levites to sing praise unto the Lord with the words of David and of Asaph the seer. And they sang praises with gladness, and they bowed their heads and worshipped." We remember that singing by itself is, is not worship, but if we are already in worship mode, so to speak, it's certainly singing is something that becomes a part of that and an action that's involved during our worship. See, especially since we see these songs and, and, and many of the psalms that are, that are written, and that's what psalms are, by the way. They were songs that are written, and, and David writes in, in every aspect, and these songs, every aspect about David's life, uh, he sang about everything. Uh, if, you, if you read through, and it's, just go through your Bible, and I've been going through and reading the psalms here lately, but go through and, and, and read the book of psalms. There's nothing that was off limits when it came to David singing. He sang about everything, and and many, if, if you go through and you read these songs, they are songs that are directed where? To the Lord. And songs that are sung back to the Lord and directed towards Him. It's easy to see how singing becomes a part of of and an action of our worship. Uh, worship as we come and as we recognize who God is and we bow down before Him, we understand that song and that, and that singing and that those praises come off of our lips in the form of a song. And so it's easy to understand how some could take then and say, oh, well, singing is, that, that's what worship is. It's just, that's what, you know, sing, you sing, you worship. No, 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 singing in and of itself is not worship, but it certainly is closely associated with it throughout the Word of God. Singing is something that, that we should do. It's something that we are commanded to do. It's something that as, as you come into the presence of God Almighty, it's certainly something that you can have a song on your heart and certainly something that you should sing to Him and to praise Him. But some people say, well, I'm not a very good singer. It's okay. It's just between you and God. It's okay. You can, it's all right for you to sing to Him. It's all right to be driving in your car by yourself and just at the top of your lungs letting God know how much you adore Him and how much you want to praise Him. I have gotten more than one, more than ten in my life, more than that. Strange looks as I'm driving along the highway just having a good time with me and the Lord and singing and people just look and they think, what is wrong with that person? 
I'm like, it's okay. Just me and the Lord having some time over here together. It's fine. No big deal. Listen, you might be out jogging and just singing your heart out. And uh, I was out mowing the other day and uh, was mowing and had my headphones in and didn't realize that perhaps I was singing loud enough that my neighbors could hear uh, some of what was going on there. And they're like, they probably think somebody's hurting over here or something. I should probably not sing quite so loud with the mower and earphones and everything. Yeah. But the point is, we ought to have a song in our heart. We ought to have a song. Song and singing and those things are they, obviously throughout the Word of God, something that is associated with worship. And you know, sometimes we, we, we stray from that and we stray away from having a song in our heart, but it's certainly something that we should have all the time. Singing is not something that we just do when we're in church together. Singing is something that we should be doing all the time. Singing is something that should happen uh, every day of our life. There ought to be a song in our our heart. The book of James uh, talks about, is any afflicted? Let him pray. Is any merry? Let him sing. We ought to be singing to the Lord. There ought to be something that we're, that we're joyful about and that we're excited about. And when we come into church, you say, well, well, well does, 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 can, we, can we not worship when we sing? I mean, I feel those things that you're talking about. I have a heart that's full of prayer. My spirit bears witness with, with God's spirit that I'm a child of God and I recognize who He is. Yes, you, you, you certainly can worship when you sing in church, but that's not the only time we worship. That's not the only time we sing, but we ought to sing when we're in church. We ought to praise God when we're in church. We do that, and as we sing and as we praise God in church, the Bible says we do that to edify and to encourage one another and to build one another up. We've, we see that, and for sake of time, we can't go to Ephesians and Colossians where the, where the Bible talks about those specifically, but that's part of why we sing in church is to, 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 to encourage one another and to build one another up. I'll just say it honestly. There are a lot of people in church who aren't building other people up. There's a lot of people who aren't building other people up with their singing. When we come to church and we sing like this, Praise Him, praise Him, praise Him. Or we, you know, when, when we just seem like we're upset at the world, it looks like we could just go home and not really care of anything else about it. We're not singing like God intended for us to sing. Certainly singing is something that is intended to be a part of and an action of our worship. And then let me close with this. The last thing, and this is something we see again and again and again throughout the Word of God, is then an action of worship, and that is serving. Serving. In Deuteronomy eleven sixteen, the Lord's speaking to Israel there, and He says, Take heed to yourselves that your heart be not deceived, and ye turn aside and serve other gods and worship them. Dozens of times throughout the Bible, this word comes up again and again, serve and worship, serve and worship, serve and worship. In Romans 1.25, the Bible talks about the, the people that God has turned over. He says, who changed the truth of God into a lie and worshiped and served the creature more than the Creator. In Luke chapter 4 and verse number 8, Jesus answered and said to him, he's talking to Satan, Satan says, listen, if you'll just bow down to me, then I'll give you all this stuff. And Jesus answered and said, get thee behind me, Satan, for it's written, thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. Let me ask you this morning, who are you serving? What are you serving? How are you serving the Lord today? If you're not serving the Lord, and I'll, I'll close with this, write this down, okay? If you're not serving the Lord, it's highly doubtful that you're worshiping the Lord because who you serve is what you worship. Who you live for is who you will worship. What you live for is what you will worship. If you live for a job, chances are you're worshiping the job. If you're living for family and, 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 and your family and your kids are all that you live for, chances are that's what you're worshiping. If your activities are what you're serving, chances are that's what you're worshiping. Whatever you serve is what you will worship. Listen, none of these things in and of themselves today are worship in and of themselves. Humility to singing to praise, 
These are all things that are associated with worship throughout the Word of God. All that you and I would have an understanding that God desires for us to worship Him and that He desires for us to come with the right attitude, with an attitude of humility and fear and praise. He desires us to come with the right approach, having lived, uh, having lived a holy life before Him, having a life of, of confessed sin and, and being right in our hearts before the Lord. And then that these actions would show up as, as we give, as we pray, as we sing, as we serve. That they would all be seen in our lives as our lives as a whole 